Um, thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Soonberg. Um, I'm really excited to talk with you about your career and how you got into voice science. So if you don't mind, let's just jump in and, and talk about how you became interested in acoustics and particularly acoustics for singing voice. Yeah, that was a long story. Um, I started my uh, my music interest in, in interest um, um, by uh, accident because I was uh, I was um, as when I went to school uh, fifteen years or something of of that or, or something like that old. Uh, I decided to go to an organ concert because I had nothing to do and it was Saturday evening and I uh, uh, didn't want to sc go to school dance. And so so I went to a church and listened to an organ concert. And it happened so that one of the guys who was um, in the same class at school as me uh, was also there. Uh, and after the concert, we started to talk, and, uh, and then uh, after that, we became close friends and uh, uh, organ fans. So we went to all kinds of organ concerts all over Stockholm. Uh, anyway, um, that was then um, starting a very intense interest in organs. And then I came to, uh, when I finished school, I uh, decided to go to Uppsala University where you could study musicology. And then um, I was then um, intending to be uh, educating myself to an organ player. Um, and for that, I needed then also to take singing lessons. Um, so, uh, and the, it started with, I, I went to the um, organ player in the Cathedral of Uppsala and asked him if I could um, practice on on the organs in the cathedral. And he said that, no, 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 unfortunately, there are so many surfaces here, but you could start in the choir. And uh, um, I had never sung before then. So, um, but I didn't dare to say that. So uh, I decided that I go there and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I did and found it um, very um, interesting and, and uh, challenging. So uh, that was the onset of, of my singing. Uh, and then uh, uh, I took so singing lessons or so. But then, um, in the musicology study, musicological studies, um, the first thesis work I was supposed to do was, of course, about an organ builder. And I looked into the literature of how, how organ builders, um, their work was being described. And uh, it was crazy. Uh, it was, they were saying it was moonshine in this timbre and it was more sunshine in that timbre and a bit of, of rattling birch leaves there and fir trees there. It was completely impossible to, uh, to regard, um, to take seriously as science. So I felt very um, uh, uncomfortable with that kind of research. So uh, then I came into contact with uh, the Institute of Technology, KTH, here in Stockholm, and um, and found one guy who was was had been doing organ work, uh, and he was measuring organ pipes in a, measuring organ timbre in a, a very special way. And I asked then um, at KTH if it was possible to do a similar thing, and it was. So uh, I was recording organs and. Uh, um, and then uh, I went to KTH and got them analyzed. And that was my thesis work in, in, um, uh, at KTH in musicology. And then I, um, yeah, then I tried to get into um, the music education, the conservatoire here in Stockholm, but they didn't want me. I was, I had started to play organ so late in life, so it was impossible. I didn't have the possibility to, 
to um, make uh, organ music from or from my fingers. So, so uh, I decided as a second choice then to continue with musicology, and then I wrote. Uh, my thesis work and my dissertation about uh, the acoustics of organ pipe because that was kind of fitting nicely with the activity of the of the uh, department because the department was uh, the one that Gunnar Fang was um, heading and uh, uh, that was about um, recognition uh, and synthesis and analysis of speech. Um, so um, that was then uh, acoustic analysis and such. So, so that was that was uh, meaningful, and uh, uh, um, Gunnar Pant accepted my plans to to develop musicology in uh, terms of analysis of organ pipes. So I was measuring acoustic um, resonances of organ pipes, inserting a little sound source in the mouth opening and the microphone up in the end and was spending a few years with that. <laughs> and I was um, uh, very fortunate to have uh, a great guy as my mentor and uh, uh, practical supervisor. He, he was uh, he was a retired lighthouse engineer who was a flute player and he had uh, constructed this little sound source that you could put into very small cavities. Uh, the ionophone, um, and then I also found a lot of uh, other people um, that were quite um, good people here at the, at the department. So I decided when I had finished my doctoral dissertation in '66 that I should try to get a grant for analysis of the singing voice because then I had been singing in choirs like. A, like crazy and taking singing lessons, uh, yeah, that 10 years, 55, 56 to 66. <clears throat> so I started with, um, uh, yes, and then Gunnar Fant allowed me to, uh, he hired me for one year so I could uh, um, get uh, time to apply uh, for a grant. And uh, fortunately, I was successful. So from uh, 1st of January 67, I, I started um, on my own grant. And then um, that was then analysis of singers, um, uh, rather tedious, tedious work, uh, but it continued uh, and I was living on grants from various research foundations since 13 years. And then I got, then I got, um, uh, th then uh, Ma Max Matthews and Pierre Boulez was offering me a position at <coughs> IRCAM in Paris, the Institut de Recherche Acoustique Musique, uh, and uh, I went there to uh, to check out how it felt to to uh, be in Paris and. Uh, and it was also looking very dull with the possibilities to get anything, uh, any possibilities to co continue with um, acoustics and music acoustics in, in Stockholm. But uh, when I was um, uh, working there um, during a few months in Irkam, uh, uh, I got the news that um, they decided to um, give me a personal chair in music acoustics at KTH. So um, then uh, that was then the um, onset of the possibilities to, uh, to form a group in music acoustics with uh, the aim of analyzing not organ pipes, but uh, the human voice and other aspects of the music, the acoustic reality behind music. Why do we like music? How should it be performed? the conversion of the score to a sounding performance uh, and uh, what are the uh, functioning of various instruments like uh, the violin. I had a guy, a friend who was doing violin research and we had one who did performance research and so on. So that we were about a dozen people 
in the group here at KTH, and we still remained at Gunnar Pant's uh, department all the time. Uh, and um, yeah, so that is that is uh, kind of uh, the um, background. Uh, yes, and the interesting thing is, I think. Yeah, I've been thinking about that several times. The significance of random accidental um, happenings in the la in our lives. Uh, so, um, if if that guy from uh, from from the same school class as I was was not visiting, that that was pure coincidence. And then, I mean, that was very significant because that uh, turned on my my interest for uh, for organs and that led then to the interest for the voice yeah, also <laughs> it was a, a long story but uh, um, but random uh, and accidental uh, occasions were uh, an important part of it but of course um, the uh, the occasions that the possibilities that appear by random is um, you don't need to take them all. You take those uh, that that you found uh, um, interesting and and uh, worthwhile to ex to um, to go on with. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's something I'm learning from doing these interviews is that everyone has those experiences where they're studying something completely different or interested mm -hmm. in over here and also interested in voice and they somehow bring those two together like um, Brad's story. No. So he was studying mufflers, uh -huh, okay. muffler acoustics, and that's what led him into voice acoustics because he made the connection between the shape of the muffler mm -hmm. and the shape of the vocal tract. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And it, it sounds like that's what happened to you too, that you were studying the tube. And then... Yes, yes, because the vocal tract is a tube, yes, and that the, the organ pipe is also a tube, yeah. Did you, did you have a moment where that you had that realization, like an epiphany, that those two things were related, or was it just always obvious? Yeah, I mean, that was obvious. Um, yeah. so, so, I mean, the, the vocal tract acoustics was was uh, commonplace knowledge and, and um, um, a common theme in this department all the time, so that's not a wide step to take. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and in the, in the 60s, were there any other people doing the same kind of work that you were doing, or were you like a lone, a lone person out there uh, forging this frontier? Uh, yeah, let's see what happened in voice research. There was, were a, um, a gang of um, doctors, or medical doctors. Mm -hmm. um, who were doing research in voice also, uh, and uh, <clears throat> and several of them then were interested in voice di disorders more than in excellent voices, um, and the, it, um, I have now uh, uh, been more and more convinced about the special advantages of analyzing singer voices because they have a nice control a very valuable control over their voices if you ask an untrained person to 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 sing a bit to phonate a bit more loudly the pitch goes up yeah so this is um, they can't tell pitch from loudness they 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 hang together so but that of course doesn't happen if you if you ask a singer to do the same thing so, and to be able to vary one uh, dimension at a time uh, and rather than um, uh, mixing up the dimensions, pitch and loudness and type of phonation. Um, that is a great uh, um, advantage when you want to understand how it functions. So, um, recently I have... Uh, analyze the voice source in in professional singers and i use that as a, as a reference for and uh, when i see the corresponding analysis of dysphonic voices or of untrained voices and i think that is uh, a very exciting this possibility because i could see uh, systematic deviations from the singers 
voices and um, between the singers' voices and the untrained voices and this phonic voices also. So, uh, no, it is it is um, it is worthwhile to analyze singer voices if you want to understand the functioning of the voice. Hmm? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So. What has it been like to watch voice science blossom over the last 30 years? Because really it's with your book yeah. and, and several, several other pioneers that this field has really taken a hold and grown yeah. exponentially. Mm -hmm. What is that like to witness that in your lifetime? It's terrible. Uh, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> no, it is wonderful, of course. <clears throat> it is uh, fantastic um, that um knowledge uh, advances in this way and uh, um a bit disturbing in this situation is um, the reluctance of uh, um of teachers of singing and of choral directors to absorb the new knowledge that is available mm. so um if you Talk. I have been talking to several choral directors and they don't have a clue about the acoustic reality that with which they are working day and night. So, um, and I think that this, that this very um, uh, inappropriate uh, because these days we like to understand what we are doing and not walking by intuition and, and uh, uh, and <clears throat> uh, feelings and and uh, esoteric um, descriptions, um, yeah. But so, for instance, let me take an example. If you have, if you have a uh, ensemble with two voices, uh, one one voice is having um, a, a tone, and that has a sort of series of partials, and then. If you then come with a third or a fifth or an octave, there are other partials, and at some co at some uh, in intervals, the partials coincide, and and that is of course that is basic to choral timbre, uh, to uh, tune the, the 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 pitches so that you get these coinciding partials. Because if you if they don't coincide, you get uh, you be, get beats or roughness or, or uh, not so um, um, for the, um, consonant uh, chords. Yeah, so so um, that is that is astonishing. I was just in a choral conference in Zagreb, and uh, and we talked about uh, the possibilities of. Uh, voice research to contribute to the education of, uh, to the awareness of um, choral directions, of the uh, directors of, uh, of um, the material with which they work. So that is, um, um, and also the singing teacher, um, uh, actually in the US they are a bit more uh, curious and eager to uh, learn more um, about the voice. So, uh, but in other countries, they uh, they shy away from facts. <laughs> they 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 want to, to have a you know, good feel there, or you should point the um, the tone in different places. And you know, it is very mysterious and esoteric and difficult to understand for the for some types of of students. Actually, that is what it is. So some types of students, they are repelled by the instructions of, uh, of the, and this uh, intuitive, the instructions that they get from, um, um, from voice teachers. So um, they don't go into singing, they think it's crazy uh, and, and they have to do something else. But in the future, perhaps they could also add to the vocal culture. Yeah, and that's why I think these interviews are so important because whatever we mm -hmm. can do to help share public information and connection 
between voice scientists such as yourself and teachers, mm -hmm. and the whole voice community kind of bring everybody together is, is mm -hmm. worthwhile, you know. So yeah. Thank you again yeah. for doing this because I, I think it's important to just keep having these conversations over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you must, uh, you must yeah. uh, um, um, present it as part of the everyday life. Yeah. And of course, um, I've been running summer courses there, one week's courses several times at our summer place uh, and uh, the enthusiasm and uh, the eagerness to learn from the people who come there is is amazing uh, and very encouraging and stimulating to to see there um, a, a basic idea is to not to talk about equations and um, physical laws but to have people experience them so uh, workshops and lectures are about 50 percent each and uh, that i think is uh, uh, a wonderful opportunity in our time when when uh, um, real time uh, analysis of sound is available because then you could point at certain properties you could see them and you could hear them at the same time and that is an enormously uh, improved uh, possibility for remembering and observing focusing your attention on one single aspect uh, at the time of, of the timbral uh, properties or the timing properties so what whatever you you want to to um, um, focus on in a pedagogical situation. Yeah, you answered my question then, which was how do we start bridging this gap between all this great science knowledge that's happening mm -hmm. in the, the everyday voice teacher. And what I hear you saying is, it's really about experience, about getting people yes. together who can, who, can, yes. who can give that. And I think um, that makes it uh, even more important, like what Ken Bozeman and Ian Howell are doing in um, having their acoustic uh, workshops in the U.S. over the summer, which is what yeah. we do, and um, yeah, that's just, I'm just putting all this stuff together in my head. Mm. I'm, mm. I'm seriously interested to know how can we do this, because it's yeah. so much work to be done in terms of bridging that gap. Yeah, yeah, so yes, so in, yeah. uh, in Las Vegas, uh, we are going to have a workshop on uh, modern technology in the voice studio uh, that is brian gill and philippe alain and um, and i we have three hours there in the day in, you know in, in late june late uh, june this summer uh, this summer yes okay i'll be uh, sure to put a link to that in the bottom of the video so people can find it yeah yeah i think um, yes then there's so much that can be done so one thing is that you could um, put um, recipe bands around your rib cage and around your abdominal wall and then with a real-time analysis see what you do with the rib cage or what you do with the abdominal wall when you inhale yeah. when you're feeling the phrase and when you when you talk or when you do other things so um, that then helps students to focus the attention on that very aspect of voice yeah um, so that is one portion and then we have the uh, voice source analysis uh, where you are, we have a Rothenberg mask and we could in real time see what we are doing with the voice source um, breath phonation and press phonation and the flow phonation and the the falsetto and what have you, uh, vocal fry, and you could do uh, everything and you could see in real time how it looks and then I think it is much easier to get control over them uh, and to um, remember uh, how it felt to um, phonate in various ways and so on. Uh, and then one analysis, one workshop is um, uh, about um, recording well the message of that workshop is that if you have the form and frequencies and if you have the voice source uh, then you have a very very good uh, description of the vo of the voice of the voice 
it is not birch leaves anymore and silver and moon. Uh, it, <laughs> it is facts. Uh, and b because they, then I, I, I do uh, the analysis of the voice, take the form and frequencies of a sustained vowel, and then I plug these form and frequencies into a form and synthesizer, MADDE, available free on the internet. And, and then, um, then we listen to the, the vowels quality and the personal voice quality of the sound produced and uh, um, in, 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 in most cases you get a very very good portrait of this sound of the voice if you have the form and frequencies correct uh, and then loudness is also very important so if you speak softly uh, you have a different voice source than if you speak loudly so that is also part of it. Um, but it is a striking demonstration of the importance of the relevance of form and frequencies and voice source to the uh, to the uh, to the voice timbre, uh, which is uh, then uh, you are cleaning the air around the <laughs> voice timbre a bit because uh, it is yeah it yeah is. and and thank you for mentioning Mada the program as well because I'll put a link in the in the yeah mm -hmm. so that people can go and get that it's a it's free resource right you can it's a free resource yes okay. yes yeah and the same is true for the real time analysis uh, and, and uh, spectrum analysis it is called RT sect a section uh, for for real time section of spectrum so RT sect is also uh, download possible to download from the same source um, okay. if com. if you if, and then they, okay yeah you also have the recording uh, system there sopran also the uh, origin of, of all this fantastic software is Svante Granqvist who does it uh, uh, because he likes it <laughs> and, <laughs> and then he puts it on his his um, website and you can download it for free are you friends with him yeah i actually was was um his supervisor during the final part of his um, dissertation work wow so well, he was working at the lab well mm. will you tell him thank you from all of us for <laughs> all of these great research no. tools it's just it's no, it is um, it's amazing how 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 the entire world has been changing yeah. um Particularly, I think one of the blessings is um, that you could, um, without working hours and days and nights and weekends, uh, do analysis of the voice source, the um, signal generated by the glottal airflow, the pulsating glottal airflow, which is um, part of the voice um, timbre contributors. So now you have in Sopran, there is an inverse filtering program so that you could analyze that. Yeah, and uh, that, was, that was terrible to do that when I started because then uh, I had to place the people into an anechoic chamber where it was completely uh, deaf uh, and you didn't hear anything in response from the from the surroundings, so it was rather taxing to sing there. And then, um, yeah, I had to make a frequency modulated recording, not on on on, on a normal tape recorder, but on a special tape recorder. And then, um, yeah, and then take a copy of it and and uh, make a loop, tape loop, and uh, that was then circulating on on the tape recorder and then uh, the inverse filter was uh, a big rack of uh, lots of knobs uh, 10 knobs or, or 15 knobs and you need to turn all of them in order to get the correct filtering and then it it was showing uh, the result uh, once per per revolution of the tape loop so there it was and then you had to do the and then once again <laughs> and I was terrible and now you just sit in your chair and um, <laughs> and and um, move the things and and you see immediately what the resulting voice source looks like so that that is fantastic 
that you could do that because I mean the thing with um, voice disorders is that there is a disorder not in the tongue or the lip or, or, or the vocal tract that is generally not contributing to any voice disorder but it is the vocal fold function itself mm -hmm. <clears throat> and if you don't, can't analyze it uh, in direct uh, ways then um, it is rather difficult to uh, to get you could you could ha have the uh, electro uh, EGG electroglottogram but you don't see the sound produ production then you see a reflection of it the collision of the vocal folds so that is good uh, but it is doesn't tell the entire story and you could take the spectrum of the uh, long term average spectrum of, of running speech or singing and you see then the spectrum where, where the parts tend to be loud and what parts tend to be not so loud. But that is also, that is formants and that is resonance and that is um, voice source mixed together and you don't know what comes from what. So um, the breakthrough he here I think today is the possibilities to analyze the voice source in isolation mm. and then also to um, to measure the underlying subglottal pressure how much pressure lung pressure do you use for producing this term so some people need to use high pressures and some could do with lower pressures and uh, and actually you can't if you change the subglottal sort of pressure, the entire voice source, all voice source parameters change. Um, so, so uh, especially and describing a voice without knowing uh, what the subglottal sort of pressure was that was used for 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 um, producing the voice is um, uh, not so meaningful. Actually, you must be uh, able to specify how loudly, at least how loudly the voice was, was um, when, when you recorded it. Uh, and preferably the, the subglot of pressure. That you could get, well, you could drill a little hole here, but that is not so ethically charming. So um, it's better to use uh, the oral pressure during P occlusion, because when you say P, the consonant P, uh, then you have an open glottis. If you don't have an open glottis, you say B, voiced, but P is um, um, uh, is um, with abducted vocal folds. And then you have a free communication from the lungs and up to the mouth, and you measure the, the, the uh, subglottal pressure as a pressure during P occlusion in the mouth. So that works well, and that is also another blessing um, that we could do that as easily now and uh, and um, record it on on the computer. Yeah, and you know, you're speaking to something that I wanted to ask next, which is where is the future of singing, specifically singing science, going? I noticed that you were part of a, an international congress of voice teachers in Stockholm last year yeah and the title of the conference was the future of singing which is really exciting yeah um, yeah, yeah. Uh, well the future of singing pedagogy uh, will be uh, um, well there's a potential in it to, to, to combine it with more um, information about the uh, reality of, of, of voice production. And some people are very eager to, to do that, like, like Brian Gill and, and Philippe Allen. Um, and if they, if they produce uh, a good uh, students, that is a strong argument for, for um, that approach to teaching voice. Um, yeah, and what is the future of singing? Yeah, it's amazing. I was my my uh, my my eldest son is playing in a metal rock band. It is called Mass Murder Agenda. <laughs> uh, Wonderful! I'm gonna look him up. <laughs> yeah, and I I was visiting with my wife uh, one of his his performances. 
and um, they came in gas masks uh, um, and uh, the hair was uh, hanging uh, in um, in straps and um, uh, and then there was a singer and he was singing growl <laughs> like that all the time and it was difficult to hear the text uh, the lyrics but uh, it was could be seen read uh, in in a video uh, at the same time uh, so um, it was uh, very far from Mendelssohn, I could say. Um, but um, and afterwards, uh, I to we talked with uh, with a singer, and he was a most um, uh, nice and uh, amable um, man. Uh, how nice of you to come to our concert and you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> was so far away, <laughs> <laughs> as you could imagine. Uh, so I was thinking, was well, that the future of voice that uh, you uh, you react your your unhappiness with the present conditions of the world, and then you could be a nice person after that, uh, uh, or it is just a fashion that that will go away. And I mean, if you look at the if you look at the compositions, uh, they are back. Uh, at least what I have heard many of them are back to tonal or classic tonal music rather than uh, uh, atonal or, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, this uh, chromatic tone um, series uh, composition from the 40s and 50s and 60s um, so it changes and, and it is um, it is um, going in ways that are very difficult to predict. But the possibilities to uh, uh, to get singers more aware of uh, what is good and what is bad, what, the, what is healthy and what is not healthy is probably going to be a bit uh, better in the future because we could describe, uh, we could describe voice uh, properties better. Also, one could then, if if a common terminology would be established for singing teachers, yeah, then singing teachers, teachers of singing, could communicate their experiences and um, give um, hints and uh, commit uh, and and communicate ideas. And if you have your personal uh, esoteric terminology that that won't happen then you build um, you build build a sort of column like uh, competence that grows with your experience but it sits uh, in in yourself in the teacher and it is difficult to to communicate so that could also be a, um, a characteristics that we could expect in the future that's something uh, very exciting to look forward to yeah, that would not be nice. Yes, and the young uh, teachers of singing—they um, they come from the conservatoires, from the music schools. They are very eager to get the information, I think. And but it is um, not so easy to sell it to people who have already found their um, their um, ways to teach that is successful. Yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's shifting rapidly. Yeah. And and thanks to people like you who have done all this amazing work, we have we have some legs to stand on and some Yeah, yeah, it is oh. the legs are there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are definitely there. So. Uh, yeah. And then yeah. that's a great place to stop too. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I just um I so appreciate you and um yeah, I know your time is valuable, so thank you for Okay, well thank you for I would love to talk again sometime soon if that if that ever sounds like something you would want to do. Yeah, that would be nice. And okay. um, are you going to Las Vegas or Philadelphia? Or um, I'm not sure yet. Mm -hmm. um, I was in Philadelphia last summer. No, uh -huh, okay. Out there, and then um, maybe soon, but I I just haven't made those plans yet. But you said you're going to be in Las Vegas in June. Yes, and more okay. than that, I will be in Bloomington in late May. Because oh, really? um, Brian and Philippa and I are running a course, a five-day course, 
uh, centered about the science of the human voice uh, in Bloomington. Oh wow! Yes, so that 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 is maybe uh, that well that that is sooner uh, and yeah, it's yeah, available I'll... and it, uh, let's see when it. I'll definitely look that up because I'm much. I, I could. Twenty three May be. May twenty three, uh, and then it goes uh, back to back to the Philadelphia meeting. Okay, so you're mm -hmm. going to do Bloomington, Philadelphia, and then you're going to be in Las Vegas. Yeah, but okay. I will go home between Philadelphia. Okay, okay. okay. Two okay. Weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you again. Well, and, thank you um, so much. Yeah, um, and yeah. looking forward to meet you again. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Have a great rest of the day. And you too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.